Perfect. And as we have people rolling in, we are going to wait just a minute um, so that we can allow everyone a chance to get in and then we'll get started. All right, everyone, thank you so much for joining the Pedestrian and Bicycle Information Center's webinar. Um, today, we are going to be covering innovations and accessibility. We have two wonderful panelists with us. The first is going to be Billy Louise Benson, best known as BZ. BZ is the Director of Research at Accessible Design for the Blind. BZ is an orientation and mobility specialist, having taught people who are blind or have low vision to travel independently for more than 40 years. She is also a human factors researcher. She is best known for her research on improving environmental access for people who are blind or have low vision, including tactile walking surface indicators, accessible pedestrian signals, various wayfinding technologies, and large print tactile, audible, and electronic signs. Alan Scott is the president of Accessible Design for the Blind, a company specializing in human factors research to promote a built environment that is accessible to pedestrians and travelers with vision disabilities. He is an experimental psychologist with expertise in human cognition, sensation, and perception, and experimental research design and data analysis, who has 20 year, or for 20 years uh, been conducting research with the AB, or ADB team. Alan also served as a professor of psychology at Elon University for 12 years and spent seven and a half years as the chairperson for the Department of Psychology. Just a um, few housekeeping items before we get started. Attendees, you are in listen-only mode, but you can still communicate with us using the Q&A pane at the bottom of the Zoom webinars window. We built in some time at the end of the webinar for a discussion period with our panelists. So we'll try to integrate your questions and comments throughout that period. The webinar is being archived at www.headbikeinfo.org slash webinars. That includes a copy of today's slides and a video recording, which should be available by tomorrow. I just wanna clarify that the slides should be posted and accessible now. This webinar is eligible for certain certificates and professional development hours. We will be providing everyone with a link to download a certificate of attendance following the completion of the post webinar questionnaire. A follow up email will contain more details about all of this. So please be on the lookout for that. I am now happy to turn over the presentation to BZ. So if you'll give us a moment so we can transition slides, we should be right back. Uh, yeah, I think you should see my title slide now. Yep, you are all good to go. Okay. So the first part of this presentation today is uh, going to be about people with vision disabilities, how they travel, who they are. And then the second part will be about PROAG and particularly how it relates to travel by people with vision disabilities. So who are we talking about? Uh, people who are totally blind or who have low vision. Collectively, we refer to them as people with vision disabilities or sometimes the acronym PVD. And the, most of them have some usable vision, which they use for travel. Uh, the large majority of them became vision disabled after the age of 60. And because of that, most of them have some degree of age-related hearing loss. So we're not talking about a population that are all really active travelers, but a lot of people who do travel, um, and, but may not, have, may not be very proficient travelers. How many are we talking about? Quite a lot, really. And when you think of our population as an aging population, the numbers are going to go up fast. So an estimate from the 2022 National Health Interviews, 340,000 adults um, age, old, 
18 and older are totally blind. Um, almost 4 million have a lot of trouble seeing even where, where, while wearing glasses. And a great many of these will be considered legally blind, um, which is, is a term used to, to determine benefits uh, for blindness. Um, and um, more than 50 million report some degree of vision loss that may affect their travel. People with, uh, with low vision have a lot of different challenges than people who are totally blind. And I just wanted to talk about those a little and show you some slides that'll help you understand the impact of some kinds of uh, 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 low vision. Um, so first there's a loss of visual acuity or a loss of sharpness of vision. So things will be blurry. A loss of visual field. So you may be able to see in the center of of the field, like looking down a tube, um, you may be able to see only in the periphery and, and not be able to see in the center of the field, or your vision loss may be patchy. You may have difficulty seeing at night. Um, you may be particularly sensitive to glare. You may have reduced contrast sensitivity. In fact, most adults over age 60 do, and that can be a, of consequence in, in travel too. So here's a slide that uh, shows a, a picture of a four-way intersection. We're looking from one corner across a five-lane street to the opposite corner. We can see crosswalk lines. We can see that the uh, vehicular signal is green. We can see a walking person signal on the pedestrian signal head. Uh, we can see cars um, stopped at the stop line. We can see cars in the uh, moving in the street beside us. Um, but now we're going to the same scene with a visual acuity of about 2,400. Um, a visual acuity of 2,200, which is somewhat better than this, is considered legally blind. But at about 2,400, we see, yeah, we can still see crosswalk lines, but we certainly can't see either the visual signal, the, the vehicular signal or the ped head. We can see vehicles, but not very clearly. We might or might not be able to tell quite what they're doing. Um, this, this photo is taken in a different intersection, a suburban intersection, um, and looking across the street and uh, with uh, central field loss, which is characteristic of macular degeneration, which is the most common cause of vision disability. Um, and we, we can see um, part of the crosswalk. We can't see all of it. There's a fuzzy patch where we can't see it all. Um, we can see the vehicular signal heads um, and um, I will point out though that, um, oops, um, we, we see those vehicular signal heads pretty, pretty clearly, but when you're only seeing with the periphery of your visual field, you don't have very good acuity there. So you wouldn't see those as sharply. And you kind of remember, you know, you're, you're moving your eye around. You're maybe trying to focus on trying to see that vehicular signal or the, or the ped head. And as you move your eye around, naturally, the center of your field, where you don't have any vision, is what's going to land exactly where you want to see. Um, so this actually shows vision that's a little better than a person with macular degeneration would have, the periphery would not be as sharp as you're seeing it here. So this is uh, a scene of the same intersection uh, with a patchy field loss that might be characteristic of diabetic retinopathy. And um, you, you see um, some of the crosswalk you can see. Uh, again, you can see the vehicular signal, but that would not be as sharp as you're seeing it in this photo. Uh, this is a, a photo crossing a street with peripheral field loss, characteristic of uh, a congenital disease called retinitis pigmentosa, in which the field gets progressively smaller, and night blindness also goes along with that. Um, and um, with with a, a central, only a central field remaining, um, orientation is the is the main problem with that. Um, much more so than for people with an acuity loss. Orientation is very, very difficult. And you can see here, safety is certainly at risk here too, because it, you know, if I'm getting ready to cross this intersection, I'm, I'm seeing the crosswalk. Um, I, I don't see any signals, 
I, I would see a car as it got into the crosswalk, but I'm not seeing anything coming. And so in terms of, of safety and a lot of the decision making that goes along with street crossings, a person with uh, peripheral field loss um, is very much dependent on listening. So there are a number of tools for travel that are used uh, by people with vision disabilities, uh, but many don't use any obvious tools. So you won't recognize them as people with vision disabilities. There are a lot more out there that you see every day that you have no idea that they in fact have a vision disability. Uh, long white cane is the most common travel aid. Uh, the purpose of the cane is scanning the environment uh, approximately where the next foot will fall so that you will detect drop-offs um, changes in surface obstacles um, from, from the long white cane. Um, dog guides, you might think, are more common than they are. Probably only 5 to 10 percent of people uh, who are vision disabled use dog guides. And the important thing to know about that is that the handle, handler that gives direction, it's not the dog that decides where to go, um, the dog provides safety, uh, but it's the handler that, that gives directions. Uh, in terms of street crossing, you may be interested to know that uh, dog guides are trained to go to the closest corner. So if you're a patient across the street and um, it's a multi-lane uh, crossing, more, more than a four-way intersection, uh, the closest corner may actually not be the one that you want to get to, that, that the crosswalk goes to. But the dog will perceive that as the target corner. So it's very important that the traveler maintain the orientation and to be able to direct the dog. Low vision aids are sometimes used in travel. Um, a handheld monocular, um, occasionally a little monocular embedded into the regular um, spectacle lens uh, is used, um, but they're primarily for spot checking, not, not for general scanning the area. But maybe for seeing a, reading a street sign or seeing a signal. There are a number of apps that are useful to people with vision disabilities, but none of them substitute for providing something like an accessible pedestrian signal. Um, we can't count on the fact that blind people who are disproportionately unemployed or underemployed, older, um, will have or be able to use apps. And so it's very important that we think of providing an environment that offers the information itself, not being dependent on an app. Apps can give excellent uh, auxiliary information, uh, but, but they're not a substitute for actually providing the information in the environment for people with vision disabilities that other people have access to. So what are some techniques of travel? Listening is really the most important technique. Now that encompasses a lot of things. Um, in particular, you may be interested to know that the vehicular sounds are used to determine the onset of the walk interval, that is signalized in interval. Particularly, they're listening for the surge of traffic through traffic in the nearest lane. Now, if you imagine that you're standing on a street corner, uh, you've got a street beside you on, on your left, a uh, street you want to cross in, in front of you. And uh, let's suppose that, uh, that this intersection has a leading pedestrian interval. Um, you, you won't know when that starts <coughs> because you're listening for the, the vehicles to start. So you're going to be standing on the curb while the driver maybe is seeing a person standing there, may be able to see that they're vision disabled or not. They may have a cane or a dog, but they may not. But for some reason, they're not going when other pedestrians are going or when it, the leading pedestrian is an interval is on. Driver's ready to, to start and, and make a, a right turn right across that crosswalk, just at the point that the vision disabled traveler hears through traffic going and steps off the curb, setting up a conflict situation unless you have an accessible pedestrian signal. But also just, I want you to think of the complexity of making that judgment. When you have, for, for instance, um, a leading left turn signal, um, or maybe as well, uh, uh, and then followed by a permissive left. Um, and think it's, it's really not 
not easy to isolate the sound of those vehicles that you really want to hear, especially if they're electric vehicles. Um, you know, it, it used to be that you'd stand on the corner and you'd hear that vehicle idling. You'd sort of select a vehicle. And when that vehicle starts to go straight, straight ahead, you go. You may not be able to hear that vehicle. Uh, electric vehicles, when they're idling, don't make any noise. And so you don't have that opportunity to focus your hearing on a vehicle that you're listening to move. It's cognitively very complex to make that judgment. And many people can't do that or can't do it very, very accurately. Um, they also used vehicular sounds to determine the direction to travel across the crosswalk. We refer to it as a lining to cross. And the primary cue for that is traffic that's parallel to that crosswalk. Well, you don't always have traffic parallel to that crosswalk. Um, it may, may be a diagonal crossing. It may be a T intersection. You're going from the stem of the T to the top of the T. There is no uh, parallel traffic to a line to, 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 to tell you the direction of that, um, of that crosswalk. Um, also, you have to, uh, we're in an unsignalized crossing, you have to use vehicular sounds to detect gaps and yielding vehicles. Um, and um, with quiet cars and with bicycles, for that matter, um, it is not easy to detect gaps and yields. You may think that there's no vehicle there. And in fact, there is a quiet vehicle approaching your crosswalk. Um, a lot of people with vision disabilities have never been taught any techniques for maximizing the use of their low vision or to use any special techniques, listening techniques to understand what to listen for, how to listen, um, what are the main cues. They don't have, may not uh, have a travel aid like a long cane. Um, so um, this, this is relevant both to, to understanding that there are a lot of people out there who, who really haven't had any instruction. They become blind gradually. They don't maybe think of themselves as blind, but yet they're missing a great deal of very important visual information and they haven't learned to use other, other skills, haven't learned to use a particular tool like a long cane. Um, and um, so we have a lot of travelers there who, who, are, who um, really may not understand the information that they should be trying to use and that is available if they, if they know how to use it. Um, another thing to, to think about is because um, people who are becoming blind, have become blind, are blind from birth, um, may for a period of time have instruction by somebody who's known as an orientation and mobility specialist who teaches independent travel skills to blind people um, or people with low vision. Um, but that didn't happen throughout life. And so that if we introduce something new in the environment as intersection designs, signal control pattern, changing all the time, nobody's gonna tell them, teach them about this. Um, so we really have to, to design and think about making the environment accessible, the information needed for travel accessible to people who have, don't have any training at all. So there are a lot of problems. Um, with for, in travel for people uh, with vision disabilities. Um, at intersections with no signal, it's hard to hear gaps and yields and getting harder all the time with electric vehicles. Um, quiet cars and bicycles are both a big problem. Signalization is getting increasingly complex. Actuated signals are not predictable. Um, they may skip a pedestrian phase. Um, Leading pedestrian intervals uh, are, are not accessible to uh, blind people uh, unless an APS is provided, uh, nor is exclusive pedestrian phasing. Um, and exclusive pedestrian phasing, it is extremely difficult to tell when the walk interval actually comes on. You might think exclusive pedestrian phasing, oh, that's going to be the safest thing for blind people. It's actually very hard. And if you have a, an intersection that has what's called exclusive pedestrian phasing, nonetheless, right turn on red is permitted, you have no idea. There is no way to be sure that you, you can make a correct judgment of when the walk interval actually begins. 
Um, so a signalized intersection that doesn't have an APS, an accessible pedestrian signal, um, definitely is lacking critical information that it, most blind people really need. Um, there may be no or maybe intermittent tra parallel traffic to align with, like at a T intersection or offset intersection. Um, crossings may be very wide and not having an, any median refuge. Um, the geometry may be very complex. Uh, curb ramps may be at the apex, not desirable, but there for many reasons. Um, all of those things can, can affect wayfinding and safety for blind people. There are a lot of treatments that we can use. Um, installing accessible pedestrian signals is a big one. Uh, we can minimize the crossing distance. A lot of the wayfinding problems happen because crossings are too wide. So whatever we can do that minimizes the crossing distance is apt to help blind travelers. We can control speed. Um, so often yielding is what we need in order to have a safe time to cross. Uh, we know that the slower the traffic, the more likely they are to yield. We can position curb ramps so the slope is aligned with the crossing direction. Um, so that as you go down the slope, you're headed in the direction of travel across the crosswalk. Well, this is a nice idea and it certainly is a good goal, but it isn't possible uh, in a lot of uh, a lot of times, um, in part because of the need to have the grade break at the, the bottom of a curb ramp perpendicular to the slope. So the person with a mobility disability using a wheelchair, for instance, is uh, going to, to be able to have all four wheels on the surface at the same time. The grade break is not perpendicular to the direction that they're traveling. They will, at least for a moment, not have all four wheels on the ground and will not have good directional control of, of their chair. It may also not be possible because of a wide curb radius. Um, a good treatment in some of these cases is to install tactile walking surface indicators. Alan's going to be talking about those. So what treatments are actually required? Um, the legal requirements for accessible public rights of way have been around for a long time. Section 504 of the Rehab Act of 1973, as well as the ADA passed in 1990, both required facilities using federal funds to be accessible. They didn't provide a lot of technical specifications for public rights of way. Um, but those are laws that said people with disabilities were entitled to accessible information in the public right of way. Finally, we have PROAG came out last year that gives technical specifications for what the legally required accessibility actually looks like for streets and sidewalks. So what's PROAG? Technically, the accessibility guidelines for facilities in the public right of way. It still uses the acronym PROAG, which came from the, the draft, which was Public Rights of Way Accessibility Guidelines. Um, so these are guidelines, and I've highlighted guidelines because important <laughs> guidelines are not enforceable. These are guidelines that come out of the Access Board for implementing the ADA in, with regard to sidewalks and crosswalks, signals, other public pedestrian facilities to ensure that they're equally usable to uh, all to all pedestrians. So when do these guidelines become enforceable standards? When they're adopted as standards under the ADA by the DOJ and DOT. So DOJ and DOT will both do separate rulemakings to adopt PROAG. We expect that a notice of proposed rulemaking will come out from the DOT within 2024. I suspect that we're going to have the DOJ, then the DOT, and there'll be public comment periods for, for all of these. DOJ and DOT may modify PROAG when they adopt it and make it enforceable, but they can't make it any less stringent than it is now. So if something is required by PROAG, don't expect it's going to go away uh, when the DOT adopts it. They, in fact, it may become uh, more, more stringent. So can we wait to provide access? Can we wait until PROAG is enforceable? Well, we really can't because Section 504 of the Rehab Act and the ADA both required 
facilities receiving federal funds to be accessible, even though they didn't provide any specifications. People with vision disabilities have been waiting two generations to have accessible pedestrian signal information. Two generations. Wait a minute. Not acceptable. It, it's the law. It's not guidelines that make jurisdictions vulnerable. And um, just pointing out that in both New York City and Chicago have been found at fault because they've been slow to make pedestrian signal information accessible. Judgments weren't based on PROAG, but they were based on the Rehab Act and the ADA. So jurisdictions are vulnerable now for not making information accessible, whether it's a, 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 an accessible pedestrian signal or other accommodations for making information accessible to blind people. So general principles um, for the PROAG requirements, um, they're required in new construction, which is envisioned as a green field. Now, how many of you are actually involved in uh, new construction? Most of what you're doing is alterations, right? And so um, how you define alterations is important. PROAG gives a pretty broad definition in the uh, proposed public rights of way accessibility guidelines. There was were a lot more detail in this definition of alteration. There are a lot of objections. And so they have made it much less specific. I think that we can expect the DOT may provide some more specificity, but um, what PROAG says is that in terms of an alteration, a change to or an addition of a pedestrian facility in an existing developed public right of way that could affect pedestrian access, circulation, or disability, or usability. Now, think, for instance, about um, you're going to replace an intersection with a roundabout. Well, it's not new construction. It certainly is an alteration that's going to affect pedestrian access. So probably it needs to comply with PROEG. Um, what about introducing a leading pedestrian interval? That places blind people directly at risk of a crash with a right turning vehicle. Um, and this is recognized in the Manual of Uniform Traffic Control Devices, has been there in support since the 2009 edition, that without an accessible pedestrian signal that lets the blind person know what the onset of the walk interval is with a leading pedestrian interval, you're placing them at risk of a crash. Um, yet changing your signal timing to provide a leading pedestrian interval doesn't even, in most cases now, even require visiting that um, that intersection. Um, so is that an alteration that would require an accessible pedestrian signal? We don't know. There aren't any specific crit criteria in PROAG itself for alterations that would trigger installation of APS. The DOT may provide specific criteria when they adopt PROAG. Nonetheless, just looking at this, if you, if you introduce an, a leading pedestrian interval, which is a known treatment that incre increases pedestrian safety, um, <clears throat> but you are placing a person with a vision disability at direct risk of a, of a crash, um, you, know, you, you certainly could be liable for that, I think, because it's quite clear in, in the MUTCD that you're placing blind people at risk if there's not an APS. So we'll move on to PROAG requirements that affect travel by pedestrians with vision disabilities. There are a lot of requirements and specifications that are related to accessible signals, or APS, and what, what we're, um, the MUTCD refers to as audible information devices. PROAG says you have to have them, but they don't give them a name. <laughs> so in, in the, the photograph on the right, on the left, we have um, a, a typical accessible pedestrian signal. Um, and on the right is a uh, one version of an audible information device and has the and this would be one that would would be used uh, in temporary traffic control 
where pedestrians have to detour. The sign says sidewalk closed ahead. Um, it has it instead of being uh, actuated by a push button, it is uh, proximity actuated, and gives a speech message um, that would say sidewalk closed ahead. And you can note the sign on the accessible pedestrian signal on the left says push or wave at a button to get uh, a pedestrian crossing. Um, not all of the older uh, uh, APS, in fact, most of them still that are installed now probably um, don't respond to a wave, but that uh, certainly is provided by uh, all of three of the North American APS providers at this time. So APS are required wherever there are pedestrian signal heads. So red, yellow, green traffic signals, PHBs, and it applies whether there's a push button that actually actuates it or it's passively actuated. Um, passive actuation is desirable in some ways, um, but it's problematic uh, when you come to fine tuning it so that you don't, it's not triggered um, when you don't want it to be by a person with a vision disability, um, you can't predict exactly where a person with a vision disability is going to end up if they come to a corner and which way they want to cross. Um, you have to have a very wide detection area and the probability of actuating both your arterial and uh, your uh, neighborhood street is, is pretty high when you often don't want to actuate the, the uh, arterial. But specifications for APS, they have a push button or passive actuation. It can be either one now. Um, but you're still going to have a device on the pole that you can touch because they require a high contrast tactile arrow that's oriented parallel to travel on the crosswalk. The purpose of that arrow is to let a person know that they pushed the right button, the button for the street that they want to cross. It's not to give them, uh, enable them to, to establish a heading across the, the crosswalk. Um, it's just not possible to establish a very precise heading from a small tactile arrow. Um, so the purpose of it is really to tell you, yeah, I pushed the button for the street I want to cross. The default walk in indication is a percussive tone. Why is that? B because it's hard for many people to understand speech. Um, it's easier to localize a percussive tone. It also doesn't have to be as loud to be heard as, as speech does. Speech walk indications are only permitted in alterations where your push buttons are not separated by 10 feet. Now, often we're finding in installations they it's an easy setting to 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 use a spot, speech walk indication even when it isn't called for when your push buttons are separated. Um, but the default is that it should be a percussive tone. I think that there will be some additional research on that. Proag called for more research on that, um, so there may be a change in that, but it'll be a while coming anyhow. They require a vibrotactile walk indication, a vibrating arrow. So there has to be a device that a pedestrian can stand and keep their hand on. It has to be located. I did, haven't talked about locations of the push button here, but they're a part of ProAg as well. Um, but they always have to be where a waiting pedestrian can keep their hand on it. The vibrating arrow helps not, not only people who are deafblind, but people uh, who are crossing in a really noisy environment and may have somewhat reduced hearing, wanting to be sure that the the uh, they're getting the walk indication from the push button that they pushed. Rest your hand on it. Arrow will vibrate. It's your push button. Um, they require a locator tone other than in the walk intervals. Anytime the walk interval isn't timing, then you should have a locator tone. So it's required during the pedestrian clearance, not an audible countdown. There is a lot of advocacy for an audible countdown. The reason that we don't have an audible countdown in, in PROAG or in the MUTCD um, it, it is that um, the more basic research on, on addition would say that um, the, the time occupied within the sort of given 
time frame that you have during the, during the pedestrian interval, um, if you occupy it with sound that people are supposed to be listening to, it's going to be hard for them to hear other sound. Well, what's the most important thing for a blind person to be listening to when they're crossing the street? It's listening for the vehicles. It's a vehicle that could kill you. It's not the signal. And speech occupies more of those time intervals than the very brief once a second tick of the locator tone. Uh, again, I think there'll be some more research coming on that because there is very strong pedestrian advocacy to have an audible countdown. Um, and the locator tone, of course, is required during the wait also. You may have a push button information message. That is when you push push the button, um, sometimes in response to holding it a second or more, you get information. And uh, the speech walk indication and the push button information have to follow model messages that have been in the MUTCD for a while. The walk indication would be wait to cross Howard at Grant. So the first thing you hear when you push the button is wait. And the walk indication is the name of the street first. Howard, walk sign is on to cross Howard. So you never hear walk first like a command. Um, it's the name of the street first and then walk sign is on. APS audible beaconing. This is something that may not be familiar to most of you. Hi, uh, BC. I, I'm just hopping in here. I'm wondering that maybe for the interest in time, would it be okay if we transitioned over to Alan's presentation? Um, it would be. I'm sorry, I have run long here. No worries, no worries. And just so the audience is aware, we will have all the slides still published on our uh, webinar archive. And then... Um, BZ's information as well in the event that you want to follow up with her to get more information on the rest of the content. Thank you, Sandro. All right. Can you see my slides and hear me okay? Yes. All right. Well, uh, I'm gonna. I mean, I'm really just picking up kind of where BZ left off. So, having introduced a lot about the travelers that we spend a lot of time thinking about and working with, I'm gonna spend some time now talking about research and guidance on the use of tactile walking surface indicators for pedestrians with vision disabilities. So, how can we use TWSIs as a source of information um, to address some of the accessibility challenges that BZ's been speaking about? Um, all of the research that I'm going to talk about um, or reference today is research that Accessible Design for the Blind has been involved with, um, and a good bit of the research, probably a, a clear majority of the research I'll be talking about is research that was done in collaboration with the University of North Carolina's Highway Safety Research Center and Kittleson and Associates. So my goals are to provide a quick introduction to tactile walking surface indicators, and then to present evidence-based recommendations in the use of TWSIs to improve the accessibility of pedestrian environments. So tactile walking surface indicator is a generic term for three types of walking surfaces used to aid wayfinding for pedestrians with vision disabilities. So those three types are detectable warning surfaces or DWS, uh, sometimes referred to as truncated domes or just domes. These are the surfaces you're going to regularly find at the bottom of curb ramps, um, or you'll find along the edges of elevated transit platforms. Another type of TWSI is the tactile direction indicator, or TDI, sometimes referred to as raised bars or guiding bars or directional bars. So another raised surface, but rather than domes, we've got these sort of elongated bars, often sort of four across on a 12 inch tile, and then they can be laid in sequence to create uh, long, long paths of these elongated bars. The third type are tactile warning delineators, uh, sometimes referred to as a trapezoidal delineator or simply as the trapezoid. In cross section, the material is trapezoidal, which means as you approach it from either side, there is an upward slanting edge, and then it levels off uh, uh, across the top surface of that material. 
And I want to talk about sort of how accessible pedestrian signals and tactile walking surface indicators are tools or sort of building blocks to address safety and accessibility challenges. And we've learned a lot about each of these individually over the years through research. And so what do we know about the kinds of information they can communicate? And then how can we put them together in environments um, to sort of serve the greater accessibility good? So I'm not really going to say much about accessible pedestrian signals today, but certainly a tool in the toolkit regarding providing information about pedestrian signal timing and intersection information at signalized crossings. And as VZ was getting to, and unfortunately we didn't talk about in detail, if also um, integrated with audible beaconing, they can provide heading assistance at difficult, complex, or particularly long crossings. The other tools are the TWSIs, the detectable warning surfaces that are what they say in the name, a warning surface, and they do have pretty defined and required uses. The tactile direction indicators can provide directional guidance in large or open spaces, including over very large distances if needed. They can also be used as an indicator of crossing or boarding locations and can provide alignment information regarding those crossings. And then lastly, the tactile warning delineator can be used as a surface to delineate spaces, to define and separate spaces that exist at the same level. So we're gonna be talking about sort of how to make use of all of these and some design guidance. And I wanna be very clear up front in just saying that all of the guidance that's provided um, in the rest of this webinar is informed by empirical human factors experiments conducted with participants with disabilities. Right. So we are recruiting, bringing out individuals with disabilities and under experimental conditions, often happening in live, active, natural environments, testing the usability, the understandability, the effectiveness of treatments of various designs or treatments in different sorts of applications. So the photographs on the screen are just a collage of, of research participants over the years participating in a variety of, of experiments um, regarding TWSIs. A lot of the research that I'll focus on and the guidance that I'll be presenting are products of a project TCRP B46. This was tactile wayfinding in transportation settings for travelers who are blind or visually impaired. The PI on that project is Sarah O'Brien of the UNC Highway Safety Research Center. And on the screen is another collage of photographs, this time um, photographs showing the installation of TWSIs at various facilities in Charlotte, North Carolina, that was a part of sort of the last research component of this project, ECRP B46. So I won't talk about each of these photos in turn, but they're showing TWSI applications in a light rail station, uh, mid-block crossing uses, uh, on transit platforms of different types, a light rail station, a uh, mid-street uh, streetcar transit platform, uh, and inside of a bus transportation center. And then there's a couple of photos of using TDI to create um, guidance paths through large open spaces. So let's start breaking this down a little bit. Let's think about some individual wayfinding challenges and then think a little bit about how to maybe use these tools to um, provide the accessibility that is really needed. So I start with the wayfinding challenge of locating crossings near roundabouts and at other mid-block locations. And then additionally to that, establishing that crossing alignment that BZ was speaking about. So getting yourself well aligned to the orientation of the crosswalk before beginning to cross. The photographs on the screen all show um, uh, examples of mid-block crossings, um, one of which occurring as you're walking towards a roundabout, the other two at other sorts of mid-block crossing locations. But in all of the photos, they sort of highlight this challenge that if you're walking along the sidewalk and you have a visual disability, Knowing that a mid-block crossing is present 
is very, very difficult. What are the cues to tell you that as you're walking, you know, 100, 200 feet along a sidewalk, that somewhere along this path, there happens to be a crosswalk? And even if you know there's a crossing somewhere along this, this um, stretch of sidewalk, locating its exact position can be quite challenging. I'm gonna show a video that highlights some of this. Um, there's no sound that goes with this video. I'm gonna speak a little bit over top of it while it plays, but I'll set it up. You've got a pedestrian here um, who is blind in the red coat. She's traveling with a long cane. The other woman that's gonna be present is an orientation and mobility specialist um, who is um, along to provide some guidance and, and um, safety support. And this pedestrian is approaching on a sidewalk, approaching a roundabout, looking for the crosswalk to cross the street to her left. So she can hear traffic on that street beside her to the left. She's looking for the crosswalk to, to cross over. And as she starts, she's using her cane and she's trailing a landscape buffer that lies between the curb and her position on the sidewalk. But as you'll see right as this video starts, I've clipped it up a little bit that landscape buffer is going to end. And the concrete sidewalk now extends all the way over to the curb. And since she's looking for a crossing of the street to her left, when that landscape buffer ends, she goes ahead and starts searching to her left and finds the curb. And she begins exploring this area in hopes of finding a crosswalk. In fact, there is no crosswalk here. Eventually, the orientation and mobility specialist gives her some direction and, and brings her back to the sidewalk, and she begins again. The crosswalk is now immediately to her left, but as she's traveling, she's now traveling a bit more centrally in the sidewalk and ultimately misses the location of the crossing and, and walks past it. She ultimately walks down this um, some distance and eventually the orientation and mobility specialist lets her know that she's missed it and asks her to turn around and try again. And so she's now traveling back towards the crosswalk from the other direction, this time with the street on her right and looking for the crosswalk on her right. She establishes this strategy again of sort of trailing along a landscape buffer on her right hand side with her cane and this time, as it turns out, where that landscape buffer ends is where the crosswalk is located, and so she successfully finds the crosswalk. But quite a challenging circumstance, right? It took her quite a number of attempts to locate this precise position along this uh, environment. She goes ahead and makes the crossings. I put that out in the interest of time. Um, she has to align to each crossing. She does reasonably well, but without any other cues, it really is a pretty challenging thing to figure out the alignment to the crossing with only vehicles cutting across your path and no other cues present. Now, re restart this process, but this time with some tactile direction indicators present in the environment. You're gonna see that now as she approaches the crosswalk, there are a set of TDI bars extending from behind the detectable warning all the way across the sidewalk. And as she's traveling along the sidewalk, her cane comes in contact with those bars and then her feet. And recognizing this as a cue to the location of the crosswalk, she turns left and walks along those TDI bars until she contacts the detectable warning at the uh, ramp. Now, the other thing that you can see is that while she was standing on those bars, she was sort of shifting her weight around. And what she was doing was getting those bars running quite perpendicularly under her feet. And by doing that, as we now come behind her with the camera, we can see that her alignment to the crosswalk is really quite excellent. So the bars are oriented perpendicular to the direction of travel on the crosswalk. She's been able to kind of get those bars running perpendicularly under her feet, and she's now very well positioned to make the crossing. I cut out some of the crossing bits in here. She makes her way over to the pedestrian refuge that lies between the entry lanes to the roundabout and the exit lanes to the roundabout. And what we're going to see here in a moment is that on this pedestrian refuge, this median, there are also two foot by two foot squares of these TDI bars to specifically provide alignment information for 
the two crossings. And so now as she's preparing to cross the exit lane of the roundabout, she again gets her feet on these bars, gets the bars running perpendicularly under her feet, and having done so, she's oriented straight towards the center of the curb ramp at the far end of the crossing. So this was not experimental research that was being shown in that video. We created it for demonstration purposes, but it very much mimics the kinds of research that was done experimentally with and without treatment under unknown conditions. And all of that research, including some work within TCRP B50, B46, resulted in the following guidance regarding mid-block crossings. For mid-block crossings, TDI bars ex should extend across the width of the sidewalk at the crosswalk location. So they're extending from near the curb or in certain instances from just behind the detectable warning back across the full width of the crosswalk to alert the pedestrian to the presence of the crosswalk. And then the orientation of the TDI bars is installed such that it is perpendicular to the direction of travel on the crosswalk itself. This figure and other figures somewhat like it that you're going to see are from TCRP uh, Research Report 248, and I'll reference that again at the very end. There are some design variations and other figures um, that are going to be um, available in that report, but certainly I'm only going to touch on a few of them today. Now, guidance for crossings at intersections, so not mid-block, but now we're thinking of corners, street intersections, those sorts of environments. The guidance is a little bit different, and specifically how it's different is that the TDI bars do not need to extend across the width of the sidewalk. Participants, pedestrians were pretty successful at locating the ramp, the crosswalk, when they're at corners but there's still a real alignment challenge under lots of design varieties, right? Again, it depends on the nature of the corner. We've got one example here, but a very common example of a case where you have a single corner curb ramp serving two crossings. And in cases like this, the slope of the ramp is generally oriented basically straight out towards the center of the intersection. For individuals with vision disabilities, what we can do is install these two foot by two foot squares of TDI bars beside the detectable warning, one for each crosswalk. And again, the bars are oriented perpendicular to the direction of travel on the crosswalk they serve. So some research that has led us to an understanding of how TDI bars can be used to call attention to crossing locations and also to provide crossing alignment. Now let's shift to another wayfinding challenge, floating transit stops and bike lanes at sidewalk level. Okay. A couple of photographs here of a bicycle lane at sidewalk level at a location in Seattle. You've got the bicycle lane and then to its right, the sidewalk. And in some locations along the block, in between the bicycle lane and the sidewalk are planters, right? sort of a natural buffer. But at many locations along this uh, stretch of sidewalk along this block, those landscaping uh, elements disappear and you've just got concrete running straight across from the sidewalk over to the bike lane and everything is at the same level. Additionally, at one location along this block on the left-hand side of the bike lane is a bus stop. There's a bus shelter and there's a small area for waiting for, for the transit vehicles to arrive. But again, you've got this entire block and what you've really only got are two locations that you are to cross the bicycle lane that provide access to this bus area. If you cross anywhere else on the bicycle lane, you find yourself in kind of a, a, a no person's land. You run into the back of other landscaping or you find yourself running into uh, parallel parking along the curb. So how does an individual with a vision disability know if there's all these breaks in the landscaping, all these possible places that I can leave the sidewalk and head towards the street, where are the specific locations where there is in fact a crossing to the transit stop? 
So guidance for floating transit stops and bike lanes at sidewalk level. First of all, if it is at the same level, there needs to be some sort of detectable boundary between the two areas, the bicycle lane and the sidewalk. And so these are places to install that tactile warning delineator, the trapezoid, to create a detectable boundary between the bicycle lane and the sidewalk, or in this case, the bicycle lane and also the transit platform on the other side. Additionally, along this stretch of sidewalk, where the marked intended crossing of the bicycle lane is located, the TDI bars are used extending across the sidewalk to call attention to the fact that this is the location at which there is a crossing of the bike lane over to another facility, in this case, the floating bus stop. At the location of the crossing, detectable warnings are used adjacent to the bicycle lane on either end of the crossing. So just like making a street crossing, you'd find detectable warnings at the base of the curb ramps at either end of the crossing. With a crossing of a bicycle lane, we've got detectable warnings on either side of the bicycle lane. And then lastly, if the, if the um, bus area is large enough um, that, you know, there's a lot of area there, an additional patch of TDI bars can be used on the boarding island to mark the approximate location of the front boarding door of vehicles that will be pulling up and using um, this particular stop. Additional wayfinding challenge are certainly protected intersections, right? So as you work to create some protection for bicyclists as they are making use of an intersection, you start to create what are now sometimes some new conflict zones between bicyclists and pedestrians. The photographs are of an intersection in Seattle, um, sidewalk level bicycle lanes that then come into sort of mixing zones near the corner with pedestrians and the rest of the pedestrian facilities before all of the, the separated pedestrian and bicycle crossings of this street. One of the unique challenges with, um, well, maybe not particularly unique, but a challenge with protected intersections is that there are still a, a real significant amount of design variance um, and so while you're already dealing with a complex situation, you also have a lot of nuance in the design variation that can make figuring out applications um, quite challenging. And so I'll call attention to that real quickly at this one intersection and two sides, two corners on this intersection. So I boxed an area of the left photograph and I'm thinking about a pedestrian who with a vision disability who's looking to cross seventh in the direction of this arrow as they approach the corner, they now have to cross what is essentially the bicycle lane. The bicycles are coming through in their own dedicated lane and then through this sort of shared mixing space and then into a crossing of the street and up onto the other side. The pedestrian has to cross that bicycle lane. And in this installation, there then is a pretty sizable area, a bit of a pedestrian refuge on the other side of the bicycle lane. So the pedestrian might want to cross the bicycle lane at any point in the signal timing to kind of get over there and then wait for the appropriate time to make the street crossing. But on the other corner, across from it, now as we think about a pedestrian approaching, they again have to cross this bicycle lane at sidewalk level, but there's no refuge beyond the, the bicycle lane. So if they approach, they wait until they detect the detectable warning and they stop and they stand to wait for an appropriate time to cross the street, they're now going to be standing in the bicycle lane waiting for that time to cross, right? So that bit of design variance certainly creates even more complexity to thinking about how to use um, TWSI materials to provide accessible information in these environments. So I'm only providing guidance for one design of protected intersection um, and look to the research report for some other um, variants in terms of other designs and, and some nuance in how those designs might be slightly different. But I call attention to some of the basic features of addressing these environments. One, as was the case before, if you've got uh, bike lanes at same level as sidewalk, you're introducing tactile warning delineators to create a detectable boundary between those two spaces. And then as you get up to the corner where you've got marked crossings of the bicycle lane, 
you've got detectable warning surfaces adjacent to the bike lane on either end of that crossing. In this particular example, there are those sorts of pedestrian refuge spaces beyond the bicycle lane and before you enter into the street. There happen to be these very wide buffers in this design, and so there's some additional space there. And so there, after you cross the bike lane, there's just some empty space with no material, and then another set of detectable warning at the street edge and before entering into the crosswalk across the street. Okay. So a mix of using TWD and DWS to provide accessible information at this sort of intersection. Turn our attention to the wayfinding challenge of dealing with large open spaces, plazas, big open environments. And so some photographs at the Spectrum Center in Charlotte, North Carolina, a big plaza outside one of their main entrances. There's also a box office and will call. There's also a little bit of a separated entrance that they use for those that need additional um, assistance when entering the building. And so you've just got this big open space with some specific destinations one may need to access, but how do you find them when they're just sort of, you know, they could be anywhere abutting this big open space. The photograph in the top right is a transit station as you enter off the street level into the top level of what is a subway station. And again, you've got, you know, fare machines that in this instance just happen to be on the left wall. You've got an elevator that you can't see in the photo that requires a very immediate turn to the right after you enter. The escalators and stairs are ahead and to the right and more or less the back corner. And so, you know, those things could be anywhere. There's no real logic to the fare machines being over on that left side and the elevator being on the right. How do you provide information about where all of these things are located? So a couple of quick videos looking at using TDI guidance um, surface to create paths. This first is in an experimental setting in more of a controlled environment in which we set it up in a parking garage. This participant was instructed to follow the path to the intersection and then to turn right. And she has been quite successful in doing exactly that. We were testing some ways of calling attention to the presence of a path intersection. The guidance that I'm gonna show ultimately resulted in our recommendation of using this sort of blank space, a little bit of a blank area at the point where the paths would intersect. And we're gonna see in this next video, another example of that exact um, application. So now having done some experimental work in a parking garage, we then took these ideas and put them into uh, an outdoor space. This actually is again at that plaza outside the Spectrum Center. This gentleman's task was to come down the stairs and to find the path and then to follow the path to an intersection and to turn left at the intersection. He does well to find the path and begins following the path. And unbeknownst to him, this path actually has a 45 degree turn in it. Not at an intersection, just a 45 degree turn in the path. And so he continues to walk straight ahead and he does lose the path for a moment, but he detects that he's not standing on or touching the, the surface with his cane any longer. And so he pauses for a moment, searches about to reestablish himself on the path. And then as he gets to the intersection of paths, he detects that blank area again and causes him to stop. And he stops and he searches ahead with his cane and then he searches to his left with the cane. And knowing that his directions were to turn left at the intersection, oh, video, he finds it to his left, turns and begins following that. Okay. So guidance for plazas and other open spaces. Make use of 12 inch wide paths of TDI to create path networks that connect locations of interest. And where the paths would intersect, points that we refer to as choice points, you have to choose at this location whether to continue to go straight or to turn left or to turn right. Where the paths create these intersections or choice points, you leave an area approximately three feet by three feet empty of any TWSI material. I'll take just a couple more minutes. I think we're okay on time. 
and end with talking about wayfinding challenges imposed by new designs. So can we use all that we've learned about TWSIs and the kinds of information they can communicate to make environments and facilities accessible, including at innovative or quick build facilities? So as a part of a federal highway project, accessibility at innovative new and quick build pedestrian and bicycle designs, Project PI, Bastian Schroeder at Kittleson and Associates, in addition to a sort of general, much broader literature review and state of practice, we did some experimental research at a quick build sidewalk extension. And so we see a photo of the quick build sidewalk extension as they're often constructed with no changes or introductions of accessible features. So they've added some flex posts about 17 feet out from the curb, bending around the corner. They've added some artistic elements, some paint to the roadway and created this new sidewalk extension. But for an individual with a vision disability, nothing to indicate that it's here, um, nothing that allows them to make use of that space as it is sometimes intended, which is to move out and wait in that space a bit and ultimately shorten the eventual crossing distance. What we found is that the treatments that most significantly improved wayfinding were threefold remove the detectable warning from the curb ramp and relocate it out to the boundary of the curb extension, extending all the way across the width of the sidewalk, uh, the crosswalk. Install that trapezoidal TWD along the transverse lines of the crosswalk in the area within the curb extension or sidewalk extension creates a detectable boundary to help keep people within this space as they make their way out to the detectable warning. And then where there are um, perimeter elements, these flex posts, the spacing of those elements should be no greater than two feet apart. We used curb stops experimentally. It was a bad idea. They were a bit of tripping hazards. So we would say, don't use curb stops, just use additional flex posts, but the spacing should be no more than two feet apart. A lot of the design guidance I showed here came from these two projects and these two reports. One of these reports is already out. So TCRP Research Report 248, the pre-publication draft with all of the guidance I just showed and lots of others is available. If you just Google TCRP Research Report 248, you'll find it. The other is the, the report coming from that FHWA project. Uh, we're still waiting for FHWA to release it. Hopefully it is for work too, too very much longer. So I will stop there and leave us some time um, to hopefully take some of your questions. Perfect. Thank you so much, Alan and BZ. We really appreciate you all coming on and, and talking with us. I think some of the feedback that we've received in the Q&A pane is that this uh, information that you shared is invaluable and uh, needs the most eyes as possible on it. So that, that's positive progress immediately. I, I think one thing that resonated the most with me um, from BZ's presentation was the um, you highlighted um, a two generation gap between like when accessibility information was truly manifested for people with vision disabilities. So if we can sort of do a scoping question down that route, I, I want to talk with you guys about what phase of the design process should innovation and accessibility for people with vision disabilities be incorporated in the design process? I'll let you have that, it, BZ. I would say absolutely at the, at the outside. Um, and, and that's the way PROAG is really written too. If you're installing a pedestrian signal, it it is an APS, you know, it just, it is accessible. Um, and I, I think it's real, really important to include that at the very outset, often with the involvement of either orientation and mobility specialists or people who are vision disabled or both. Gotcha. Okay. Yeah. I, I think that ties in nicely to another topic area that we had come through, um, within the questions and that that's going to be. How, how can we create effective education campaigns to, to increase the knowledge of these different um, sort of countermeasures that y'all highlighted, but going beyond that inclu and including people with vision disabilities within the design process for those countermeasures? I'll, I'll, I'll jump in 
I'll jump okay. in and say, I think, you know, the, the organization, you know, traffic departments, those who are doing the design work, I think it's important. So we, we often hear this question, how do we involve, you know, individuals with low vision in that process? How do we involve individuals with cognitive disabilities in that work? And I would, I guess the, the part I would give back is those aren't the only people you should be involved. In. And BZ kind of mentioned it. In my mind, there can often be a challenge between having a traffic engineer trying to say, well, let's bring in a couple of folks who are blind and, and have a conversation. Sometimes I think that conversation can be very difficult. They use different sets of language. They talk about the same things in different ways. They have very different understanding. But sometimes it's it's who's the person in between that serves as a bit of an intellectual translator between those two groups. And sometimes as BZ said, that might be an orientation and mobility specialist, right? It's an organization of individuals who work with those with cognitive disabilities, whether that's you know rehab professionals or others, to think about how to build relationships between you know, traffic engineers and those individuals. And then when you say, okay, we've got a new project, we'd like to get some feedback from some individuals with cognitive disabilities, some individuals with mobility disabilities or vision disabilities, you've got this person that sort of serves as an intermediary to say, great, let's do it. Let's bring some people in and have more of a facilitated conversation that I think will ultimately in a lot of cases be far more effective and valuable than it would have been if you try to just go straight without that sort of individual. Yes, I'll just, just emphasize that, that an orientation and mobility specialist or other rehabilitation specialist is likely to have worked with people with, with a wide range of disabilities, wide range of low vision, for instance, and, and true for mobility disabilities as well. Um, and they're really important people to involve. Uh, important certainly to involve um, the person with disability themselves, um, but they only have their own experience and may not understand very much about how other people travel and, and their information needs and their safety issues. Um, so it, very, very helpful um, for engineers and planners to develop uh, working relationships with rehabilitation specialists of various sorts. Awesome. Thank you for that clarification. I know that was a, a popular sort of idea that came through in the in the chat or the Q and A pane. So that that's helpful to scope us um, diving into something a little bit more specific in relation to the webinar. Um, we we received several questions about accessibility uh, or the accessibility of different crossing treatments, traffic signals, rectangular rapid flashing beacons, pedestrian hybrid beacons, and others. Can you all speak to the differences between these in terms of being equipped with the APS or providing other audible information to pedestrians about when to perform their crossing? Yes, um, all of the APS do a very good job of, of, of notifying you of the onset of the walk interval and the, sort of the, the duration of that walk interval. Um, it is somewhat controversial what should happen in the pedestrian clearance interval, but there all, always is some uh, indication of that at any rate. Um, it does, doesn't just go silent like the old APS that were just mounted on the bed head and told you about the walk interval and that was all. Um, there always is some, some ongoing information during the clearance interval. And then uh, the vibrotactile indication for people who are challenged uh, to hear either because their hearing is poor or because the environment is too noisy. Um, so in terms of, of the accessible signal, that's pretty clear. Um, the uh, PROAG also requires audible information devices at uh, pedestrian activated warning beacons like RRFBs. And that is, is often um, sort of physically like uh, an accessible pedestrian signal, but it doesn't give um, the rapid tone or a speech or a vibration to say that this is a walk interval because there isn't one with an RRFB. It's a yellow, yellow signal. There is no uh, red signal that tells people that traffic is supposed to have stopped anyhow. Um, that's the only time that it's appropriate to give uh, the walk indication. So for the um, pedestrian actuated um, warning beacons like the RFBs, um, then a locator tone is needed 
uh, if you have to push a button so you can find it, you know that it's there, you know there's a crossing there um, because you hear that locator tone. And then the response uh, to the locator tone, ProAg doesn't say what it's supposed to say. They say you have to, to tell them what's happening here, but they don't say what you sh the message should be. Uh, you go to the manual and uniform traffic control devices for that, and it will tell you that the message should be warning lights are flashing. Gotcha. All right, thank you so much. I, I think that definitely helps um, clear up, you know, sort of the discussion that, that was had regarding um, the re reliability and, and how sound bounces off of certain buildings in past evaluations of the technology um, and, and really captures how how it has, how innovation has occurred and, and technology has advanced in the area. So that that's really uh, valuable context. Um, jumping into the maintenance with TDI bars, what are issues that come up with maintenance? Um, like sort of thinking within different weather conditions, snow, can they become tripping hazards when they, they wear down? Um, sort of in, in that vein with the question. Well, anything can be a tripping hazard in any weather. Um, so <laughs> there's no way, way to make it perfect. Um, and northern climates have generally found that the material out of which they're made is important, generally preferring cast iron or steel, um, which can be coated to be different colors uh, and be, still be very slip resistant. Um, and um, often uh, removal of snow using a rotary brush, which is a common tool. Um, there are many jurisdictions that have to deal with heavy snowfall, uh, works better than any kind of a plow with a blade on it. Um, some materials are more likely to be torn up or have the domes on truncated domes damaged, for instance. Um, so, you know, it depends a lot on where you're located and whether you're dealing with snow removal um, and um, or um, excessive heat in which the, the metal ones tend to get so hot that, that they can burn a dog guide's feet um, and may, may not be preferred in, in Tucson, for instance. Um, but that, you know, it's up to a jurisdiction to, to choose the material that's going to work best in their environment. Yeah, and the only thing I would piggyback on that is just to say detectable warnings of different materials have been around for a long, long time. And what we're talking about with TDIs, I mean, the manufacturers, the materials, right, they're, they're coming from the same places at this point. Those that are manufacturing and are thinking about using the same, you know, or they are using the same sorts of materials and things. So, if a jurisdiction has experience with the maintenance cycle for detectable warning surfaces and well we used brick over here and this happened and we used you know polymers over here and this happened you know that information then just translates to if we're going to start using tdis in some of these same environments you've got a direct comparison you've got some experience with the materials to know what's working in your jurisdiction um to, to sort of help drive that that decision making i think and, and, oh, last thing, and the profile, right, of the raised bar TDIs, in terms of the height, it's the same as the domes, right? It's it's the same kind of edge profiles, the same height. So all of these things, it's just you've got a long bar instead of individual domes. So it's not like you suddenly have all this extra, you know, uh, elevation change that's going to get whacked by something that's coming across it to clean it or other things. You're dealing with a lot of the same basic geometries or profiles so again, you should be able to translate some of the experience with detectable warning maintenance over to thinking about what you might have to deal with with TDI maintenance. Gotcha. The drainage is an oh. issue with the, with the TDIs and, and with the, the trapezoidal tactile warning delineators too. But these, these are manufacturers are providing for installation systems in, in which you can create gaps for drainage. Thank you. I think this flows nicely into another question that an attendee had. Um, they were just wondering if they can get some like clarification on whether or not tactical warning delineators are the same or similar to detectable edges. I would say the tactile warning delineators are are a kind of a detectable edge. Now it's really important from the perspective of the blind traveler that you have three kinds of things because they give you different messages. And it's important that the tactile warning delineator, where you really want to differentiate between a pedestrian way for path, for instance, and a bicycle path at, as a bicycle path at sidewalk level, um, that 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 boundary needs to create a, give a message to a blind pedestrian that they shouldn't cross that 
And so you don't want to use a detectable warning, but that's a, that's a place that alerts you. Often you are going to cross or you're going to board. Tactile warning delineator said, don't go here. There's danger on the other side. Don't cross this. Um, and so it, it's important that you have that third kind. Now, before we had done the research to, to, to figure out what was usable, there there was a, were various things um, that, that were used. Often the raised bars were used um, where a tactile warning delineator would be a better choice. Um, but that gives a wrong message to blind people because usually you can travel on either side of the raised bars. There's no in, uh, indication of, of danger with the raised bars. If you have a, an area, for instance, in a, in a shared street, a boundary in a shared street where vehicles are permitted um, and, and there's an exclusive pedestrian way, a good use for the uh, tactile warning delineator might be to establish that boundary so that a person who is blind will know I'm, I'm safe on this side. There'll be dragons over there, vehicles or bicycles. <laughs> All right. And then uh, keeping in that same theme, one question that came up is that, is there a reason why tactical mats slash TDI bars are usually yellow or red slash orange in color? Yeah, I, I would say this the high salience of, um, of the safety yellow. In fact, uh, in the, the private sector accessibility standards under the International Code Council, there is a lot of discussion of requiring detectable warnings to be yellow. That has not been done other than some states and some jurisdictions have decided that they should be yellow. Um, and, and it's because of their high salience, uh, e even in situations in which if you, you calculate, compare the, the light reflectance values, um, there may not be such a high percentage difference, but the, the salience of that safety yellow, and in addition to its association with an indication of danger, um, make it a, a choice of, of many places. Um, and it, 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 we don't, of course, have a standard uh, at this point for in terms of color. All we have is light on dark or dark on light. But there's a great benefit if you have difficulty seeing to know that this color means something to blind people. <laughs> this is for me. <laughs> um, and whether I'm, I'm using the safety yellow for all the TDIs, um, in which case it, it's just sort of, I, there's, there's this yellow over there. Okay. <laughs> I'm going to find out what it is. Um, it, it, you know, psychologically, it's a lot better than uh, um, here in Fairbanks, where, where I live. Um, we're now requiring uh, safety yellow, but there are a lot of, of cast iron ones that just are weathered um, to uh, a sort of orangey brown. Um, and and it, it's much harder to, to, to see them. They're just less distinctive, even though they have high contrast with the the cement that they're on, um, concrete that they're on, um, they're, it's just not as easy to, to spot them. Gotcha. That I, I think there's a, a more general question that fits the theme of what you just discussed. Um, does ProAg currently have any details on TDIs or TWD um, and how these tactical walking surface indicators impact people with mobility impairments? They don't. Um, PROAG includes detectable warnings. It says nothing about tactile direction indicators or tactile warning delineators. Um, that's what that, that was the first part of your question. And what, mobility what impairments. And, and uh, mobility impairments. And yes, in fact, but before we, we wanted to, to come out with a recommendation of TDIs uh, across the sidewalk to help people found, find side, uh, crosswalks that were hard to locate or transit stops, um, mm -hmm. we, we knew we had to look at the effect on people with mobility disabilities. And especially given that worldwide, a treatment like that is fairly common, except that the bars go parallel to the direction of travel. And we put them perpendicular. Well, why do we put them perpendicular in the first place? We put them because mm -hmm. perpendicular because we wanted them not only to serve as uh, an, an alert that here's an opportunity to cross or, or to board a tra transit vehicle, but also if we could have just one surface that could be used both to say where, but also to align perfectly to cross. Well, 
we had done some laboratory research that said people can't align very well from something that goes in the direction of travel. Intuitively, you'd think, yeah, of course it should go in the direction of travel. Um, but you can't do that very accurately. You can if it's perpendicular to your direction of travel. So that's why our bars are perpendicular to the direction of travel. If you travel widely and around the world, you may have often seen them the other way. And you wonder, well, why the heck are we doing it differently? Because people can align with it. And it is a good direction indicator if you turn the bars perpendicular to the intended direction of travel. Um, and so we had to find out what the effect was on people with mobility disabilities. So we had, I think, 40 people with different mobility disabilities using all kinds of aids, uh, crossing um, two foot wide uh, strips of, of raised bars that, that were e either perpendicular to their direction of travel or parallel to the, their direction of travel. And we found that it was much easier mm -hmm and much preferred by most people to have them parallel to their direction of travel. Well, so you imagine a person in a wheelchair who's, who's not gonna cross, who wants to just keep going down the sidewalk, but they've got to cross over this two foot wide thing. Well, if it's parallel to their direction of travel, it's almost a non-issue. Non you know, they may or may not go precisely between the bars, but it's pretty much a non-issue. True for people with using, uh, rollator walkers as well. Um, if you if they're crossing over the ones that are perpendicular to the direction of travel, <laughs> a lot of vibration, which can cause a, a lot of nerve pain for some people. Gotcha. I appreciate it. Um, so just looking at this is probably our, our, our last question. I want to uh, go back to the more general level and, and ask y'all to both share out on it. Um, but I, I think a really important question that we received was how would a person who's blind or becomes blind be trained with these techniques? Um, the, the example that they gave was, does the eye doctor have to refer to someone to, um, in, in order to access this level of training? Not, a, not at all. Sometimes it may come about that way. Um, or uh, in most states, there are rehabilitation agencies, sometimes a specific agency dealing with blindness. Uh, often it is together with other disabilities. Uh, certainly don't need a referral from anybody. You know, that may be the way they get there, but you don't definitely don't need a referral. I guess the only thing I would add is just, you know, if we, if we promote a built environment that has these features present for anybody who might need them, when you talk about individuals who do lose their vision over time, if they've spent a lifetime encountering these things, if they're just a part of the built environment that we're all sharing, they may not give them a lot of thought when they don't need them, but they become an element of the environment that's always been there and has always been available to somebody who may need them. And you may just find that even though, you know, an individual doesn't have a lot of training or is just starting into training, their familiarity would be very different if it was just a part of the environment to ensure that these accessible features are just always present for those who do need them. Awesome. Well, thank you all so much. Um, thank you for everyone who attended. Uh, sending a, a round of applause to both um, BZ and Alan for their their very, very valuable presentation that they gave to us um, as a part of the Pedestrian Bicycle Safety Information Center's webinar series. I just want to take now as a, a quick second to remind everyone that the video of this webinar will be archived at www.pedbikeinfo.org slash webinars tomorrow. The slides currently are available and they do have the contact information for both BZ and Alan if you want to reach out and get to any questions that we didn't cover today. Um, again, really grateful to have BZ and Alan with us today and hope that everyone has a good rest of their Tuesday. Hey, Sandra. Can you hear me? Yes. Um, so I, I noticed you haven't closed it yet. Should I continue trying to answer questions that are in the Q&A or just leave? Um, I'm going to go ahead and end the webinar for everyone. Uh, okay. Yeah, and then right. we should be good. <laughs>
No problem. Thanks. Alrighty. All right. Bye. Bye.